And now onto our dinosaur of the day, Lophostrophius, which was a request from Paleo Mike 716 via our Patreon and Discord, so thanks. It was a coelophysoid theropod that lived between the late Triassic and early Jurassic around 205 to 196 million years ago in what is now Normandy, France, in the Moon Arrow Formation. That's very old. Yeah. It looked kind of like Dilophosaurus, but smaller. Hmm. You know, it walked on two legs, it had long arms, a long tail, and a couple of crests on the top of its head. That is very Dilophosaurus-like. Yeah, but it was small to medium in size. It's estimated it could grow up to 9.8 feet or 3 meters long and weigh up to 220 pounds or 100 kilograms. Okay, so that's maybe half the length and a third or less of the weight Mm. than a Dilophosaurus. There are some scientists, though, such as Molina Perez and Lara Mendy, who've estimated it to be up to 17 feet or 5.2 meters long and weighing 300 pounds or 136 kilograms. So, a bit bigger. It's really interesting that it might have survived the Triassic-Jurassic extinction. Yeah, yeah, because you have it on both sides there, since that's right at the 200 million year mark Mm -hmm. ago, and it, it might be on both sides. That's pretty cool. Not a lot of dinosaurs or animals in general pulled that off. <laughs> That's true. The type species is Lophostrophius arlensis, and the genus name means crest vertebrae. That name refers to the low crests on the top and bottom, or the dorsal and ventral neck vertebrae. The species name refers to the arrow quarry where the fossils were found. Originally, Lophostrophius was thought to be Halticosaurus, and then later it was thought to be Lilian Sternus, before it became known as Lophostrophius. Halticosaurus is a dubious theropod that lived in the Triassic, and that one was named in 1908. And Lilian Sternus was a basal neotheropod that lived in the Triassic in what is now Germany, and that one was named in 1984. The fossils of this specimen of Lophostrophius was first described in 1966 by Claude Larseneur and Albert Felix de la Parent, and they described it as Halticosaurus. They described a partial skeleton that was found in 1959. It included a tooth, a number of vertebrae, including five neck vertebrae, and parts of the pelvis. A quote from the 1966 paper that described the skeleton said, quote, one tooth 35 vertebrae, several bone fragments, and coprolites were discovered in the blackish and sandy clayey beds of the arrow quarry, end quote. One tooth and 35 vertebrae. Yes. I feel like you're more likely to find 35 teeth in one vertebra <laughs> for most dinosaurs. <laughs> yeah, probably. The tooth that was found was two centimeters and was slightly recurved and flattened and it had serrated edges. And the author said, quote, this trenchant tooth at the same time as a knife, saber, and saw, according to Buckland's remark, end quote. So they recognized that they couldn't classify a dinosaur based on just one tooth, but they said that the tooth pointed them to the dinosaur being a theropod, and then the vertebrae made it seem like it was Halticosaurus. Okay. I want, you gotta wonder when you find a single tooth next to some vertebrae, if that tooth does in fact come from the vertebrae. Or if it was shed and... Something moved on. Because they lost so many teeth, theropods. Mm. It's interesting. Maybe it was the way they were found in the quarry together. Yeah. Now, seven of the vertebrae are from the neck, which are, quote, remarkable for their elongation, end quote. And the author said, quote, is not so frequent in dinosaurs, end <laughs> not quote. Not so frequent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of times I end up quoting things because I like the way the authors phrased it. Mm-hmm. They also found three coprolites with fish teeth and scales, which may have belonged to the Halticosaurus, now known as Lophostrophius. So in other words, they're fossilized dung. Mm -hmm. So it means it would have been eating fish, because you said fish teeth, and I assume that's fish scales, they're thinking. I think so. And in the quarry where the fossils were found, the author said, quote, mollusk shells form true marbles in places. Ooh, mollusk marbles. But that just points to the marine life. Mm -hmm. In 1993, Guy Cooney and Peter Galton reclassified the specimen as Lillian sternus arlensis. But later, more differences were found, such as having an extra pair of cavities in the neck vertebrae. So splitting the dinosaur to a new genus as Lophostrophius made sense. 
So first it got assigned to one that became dubious. Mm -hmm. And then so they had to give it a new classification. So they stuck it in with another existing dinosaur, Leon Sternus. And then later on, they decided, wait, no, it's different enough yeah. that it deserves its own genus. So then it got pulled back out again or pulled out for the first time, I suppose. I think so. I didn't look too much into Halticosaurus in terms of the timing of when it became dubious. Gotcha. In 2000, Oliver Raoult and Axel Hungerbuehler published a review of European Triassic theropods and suggested that Lillian Sternus arulensis quote, might represent a distinct genus, but more material is needed to confirm this, end quote. They found major differences in the neck vertebrae, such as the extra cavities, but said that whether or not that's enough to merit a new genus depended on finding more fossils for comparison. Hmm. So another one of those hashtag need more fossils. Yes. I was hoping you were going to say, and then they found a skull or something, <laughs> you know, like tying that tooth to a head or somehow more than just the vertebrae. That does happen sometimes. But not in this case, at least not yet. In 2004, Matthew Carano and S.D. Sampson published a review of coelophysoids from the Lower Jurassic of Europe and found that Lillian Sternus slash Lophostrophius was a coelophysoid. Then Lophostrophius finally was officially named in 2007 by Martin Escura and Guy Cooney. They found that Lillian Sternus arlensis had enough unique features to be renamed Lophostrophius, including, quote, constant length of caudal vertebrae along the tail, end quote. And they found that features Lophostrophius had in common with Lillian Sternus, Lillian Sterni. It's <laughs> oh, a clever name. <laughs> yep. Were, quote, more widely distributed among coelophysoids and basal dinosaurs than it was thought, end quote, meaning those features weren't enough to keep them grouped together. They also found Lophostrophius to be more closely related to Coelophysidae, then Lillian sternus, Lillian sterni. Okay. That's another good reason to pull it out. Yep. Although I guess someone could lump it in with a different Coelophysid. <laughs> I wonder where that idea of them having the two crests on the top of the head came from. Maybe just its similarities with Dilophosaurus. The crest refers to the cranial cervical vertebrae. Oh, okay. So it's not on the top of its head. No, but if you look up paleo art, that is how it's often depicted. Okay. You know, between the snout and the eyes. Yeah, that's, that's like Dilophosaurus, right? Mm-hmm. But we'll have to eventually find the skull to be sure about that. Yeah, that's a good point. I don't know why it's depicted that way. There's not too many other animals that were found in the quarry where these fossils were found. But they have found fish, like we mentioned, and also plants. For those of you who listen to our Dinosaur of the Day segment and you like it, please consider becoming a patron. We take new Dinosaur of the Day requests from our patrons and offer a bunch of other perks as well. So check out our page at patreon.com slash or click the link on the left. <laughs> 